and welcome to another episode of The Hump with Katie. I'm your host, Katie Thoreau, and this week I am so excited to bring you part two of our episode with the great bassist, educator, composer, and arranger, overall great human being, John Clayton. If you're new to The Hump, this is a series where I interview some of the world's most talented artists and musicians and find out why are they so amazing, how did it all happen, and ultimately, what can we learn from their journey? Before I bring you today's amazing episode, I'd love to thank our sponsors, and first up, we have the clothing company, Jams World. You guys, I absolutely love Jams World. I'm wearing a Jams World right now, of course. And the reason why I love it is because the fabric is made from 100% Spun Crush Rayon, and it keeps me cool and comfortable. They've been making clothing in Honolulu, Hawaii since 1964. And the artwork is so unique. It's screen printed right onto the fabric, and it looks like a piece of art. Go to jamsworld.com and use the promo code jazz15 and you'll get 15% off your entire online purchase. Next up, I'd like to thank Colstein's String Shop. I absolutely love Colstein's. They are doing amazing things for the bass community. They have two amazing locations in Long Island, New York and a killer online store. Go to colstein.com and use the promo code KD10 and you'll get 10% off your entire purchase. All right, the time has come to bring you part two of our very special episode with John Clayton. If you haven't been able to check out part one yet, it's available, of course, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, all that good stuff. I won't give too much away, but in part two, we dive more into how John got into composing and arranging and just some more amazing life lessons that he learned along the way. And of course, we also talk about why bass players love to cook and eat. I'm keeping this nice, short, and sweet so we can get right into it. So without further ado, here is part two with John Clayton. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. You're absolutely right. So uh, after in my first year, after my first year at Indiana University, when we had a summer break, just before that, I got a call from my old boss, Murray McEachern, who was still in Los Angeles. But he said, I've been asked to put together the Tommy Dorsey Big Band playing all of his original charts and stuff like that. The Dorsey estate uh, was supporting this. Uh, Can you play bass? And I said, well, I'm still in school. I've got to finish the semester and stuff. Um, Maybe after that, if, you know, so anyway, he's, Murray said, well, I'm putting together a band now. Do you know some guys that could play in it? Mm -hmm. Um, Around that time, just before that, I had met Jeff Hamilton. We were both students, and um, we became good friends, and uh, Jeff was studying with John Von Olen. uh, And John Von Olen's drumming really loosened Jeff up and got him, Mm -hmm. you know, to to be basically uh, who he is now, the the core of who he is now drumming-wise. Um, so I said, I know a good drummer because Jeff, I think Jeff had dropped out of school mm-hmm. that, at that time. He had done a year at school and then got into the lessons with John Von Olin. Basically, he either was going to drop out or just take a hiatus, you know, so and focus on playing. So this came at the right time. So he went on the road. I had to stay in school and finish out the semester. He went on the road with his big band. But they weren't happy with their bass player. So when I finished the semester, I went on the road with the band and Jeff and the guys as well. And that was that was a lot of fun because, you know, <laughs> Jeff could really try out all these things that he'd picked up. Mm-hmm from John Von Olin and uh and I got to I got to go on the road, make some money, uh play with Jeff and you know, it was whatever, twenty twenty, maybe, twenty years old, twenty one maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh something like that. So yeah, that was that was a great summer. Mm-hmm. Um so I don't I don't wanna you know, I'll just fast forward. So then you and Jeff played with Monty Alexander uh, for a few years, like, you know, all together. Um, what was it like being in a trio for that long and getting to work on music? Oh, that was amazing. It, you know, it was pretty intense. Uh, so basically what you said would be true under normal circumstances, you know, like three years. 
it was actually only two years. Mm -hmm. But that first year, we worked 50 weeks. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And loved it. Yeah. Loved it. I mean, it was, we were hitting, we were just playing everywhere all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was my first, first job, first music opportunity out of school. Mm -hmm. I was finally done with school. God, I was so ready. I mean, everybody is. Yeah. When you get out of school, you're like, oh, fine. Because if they're doing it right, you you should not that you should hate school, but you should feel like school's getting in the way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, you're you're so into your path. So that was the way it was for me. So um, the first year with Monty Alexander was like the second year. We didn't work quite as much. It was a bit more broken up, but it was still a lot, um, and it was pretty wonderful. I mean, Monty Alexander, we would we would rehearse things, but really we would rehearse on the bandstand. We might get the mm-hmm. skeleton of something. And then on the gig, um, Monty might throw us some cues or um, Jeff might do something and Monty might, you know, point at him and, and give him, you know, go with it and mm-hmm. whatever. So just things kind of unraveled that way. Um, unraveled, maybe that's wrong turn it didn't unravel <laughs> and fall apart they just was, panned out yeah yes <laughs> yeah so yeah it was it was really great and then there were certain things that that monty had uh arrangement wise from former yeah trios that we also played but we'd always put some kind of changes some alterations to it uh not just jeff and me doing it but just naturally yeah. with us yeah, it was nice. You didn't have to step in and play like somebody else, yeah. which sometimes people expect in certain bands that are already established. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, the the recording from Montreux, I mean, I didn't, of course, I didn't hear it when it came out, but it, it was like, still when I heard it, it was like earth shattering. So I could only, I don't know if it was like that when that came out, that performance, but it just seemed like, like where did this come from <laughs> yeah it was you know that for us that was um a really fun kind of important thing because it was a big deal we'd never played in Montreux together um so many of our heroes were there you know um Thad and Mel played before us I believe I think it was before us and maybe Stan gets after getting foggy. <laughs> Jeff Hamilton would know. Yeah. He's got a steel trap memory. <laughs> but I remember watching Thad conduct and listening to the band and just being so oh, it was just heaven. Um and then when we went on, we were I remember we were I was, let me just say I was. I was pretty nervous. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, just <laughs> the whole aura yeah. of that Montreux festival and the, um but the guys wouldn't let me get hung up on my nerves you know mm-hmm. they we were playing music together um so that was pretty cool that was that was and the audience is into it so it just all kind of came together yeah uh if i'm not mistaken we made a recording just before that Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that the stu- a studio recording okay. for MPS, which was Monty's label at the time. And we went to Villingen, Germany, where Oscar made all those records. Yeah. And uh, we played in that guy's living room, Hans Georg Grunestrier. We played in his living room. Uh, and that was, but for some reason that didn't come out first because mm-hmm. soon after it might have been the same year i imagine must have been the same year we did the montreux thing and that had such a sparkle to it i think that they wanted to release that first yeah it's like every time i listen to it it's magic <laughs> yeah um so now we will go back to that when i was i wasn't to, to the big band you know 
to the other big band that you got to play with, uh, uh-huh. Count Basie. Yeah. So how did that come about? Well, when I was in, when I was at Indiana University, it was my dream, even before then, to play with Duke Ellington. Mm. But at Indi- while there at Indiana, Duke Ellington died. And um, so then I went on the road to Monty Alexander, like I said. And one of my other dreams was to play with Count Basie. And I was loving playing with Monty Alexander, but I kind of... If there was a chance, I didn't want to miss out on the mm-hmm. opportunity. Basie was getting older, and um, that's that sounds rhetorical. Everybody's getting older, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, uh, so I called Ray Brown, and um, I told him, you know, I knew that he knew Count Basie, so I told him about my idea, my wish to play with Basie, and he said. I'll see what I can do. So he, of course, called Count Basie. And the next day, I was talking to Count Basie. And he said, uh, hello, young man. I hear that you like to play in our in my band. I said, yes, sir, Mr. Basie. He said, well, I'll have my manager call you. The manager called. And he said, well, it just so happens our bass player is leaving in two weeks. Can you mm. be here? <laughs> of course, yes. Yeah. So I, I told Monty Alexander, you know, And he gave me his blessing, and that's how I joined Count Basie. Yeah, and that's a good, I don't know if it's a lesson or what it is, but it's like you're doing this thing with Monty, and it's going great, but it's okay, you know, to do something else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the whole, you know, you've heard me preach to you and others, follow your heart. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, exactly. You really can't go wrong if you do that. Um, is that where you got the bug for arranging, writing in Basie's band? Yeah. I'd never taken arranging lessons, never written for big band. I knew how to transpose for the instruments. Mm-hmm. My brother Jeff taught me how to transpose for the saxophones, and the trumpet was no big deal. So um, I asked Mr. Basie if, you know, after hearing this incredible music every night, <clears throat> and 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 part of that came because um, came about because um, one night the one of the the road manager or whatever said, "Hey guys, um, on stage uh, we're going to start the show in a minute." So I had just enough time to put my bass in, in front of the music stand and get in the curtain goes up ladies and gentlemen the Cal Basie orchestra I looked down I had forgotten my music mm-hmm. it was backstage so I had to play yeah. and that's yeah. when I discovered that I actually had memorized the book so th- that freedom then let me not use the book and just listen to all this incredible sound um, so that's when I asked Mr. Basie is it okay if I write something and he said oh yeah sure so I wrote the first piece for the band, uh, copied it myself, did all this stuff, and and the band played it at a rehearsal. They hated to rehearse, but they played it. <laughs> and it sounded so bad, so bad. You can't imagine, it sounded so bad. Totally embarrassing. <laughs> and um, and, and the, 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 the guys were like, hey, man, cool, you got the right. I knew it sucked. Yeah. Uh, but I was, uh, I was not discouraged. Mm -hmm. And on the first break that we had, I went to Holland to be with my then girlfriend, now wife, and just hang out. So while I was hanging out, I actually bought in Europe, uh, a copy of the explosion record, you Mm -hmm. know, (laughs) and, of of Basie. And uh, they they had Splanky on there, and Splanky is the song that gave me goosebumps every night that we played it. So I basically transcribed that and used that as a model to write my second big band song, which was Blues for Stephanie. And then the guys rehearsed it, and uh, 
at the end of it, Mr. Basie, you know, looked at me and he said, let's do that one more time. <laughs> so, oh, nice. Yeah. So, and after that, it just kind of more and more writing, getting tips from the writers in the band. Um, you know, they're, they're the ones that told me, because <clears throat> I'd, I'd written my score in C mm-hmm. and in verses transposing for the instruments on the score. Mm-hmm. And they looked at my score and said, what do you, why do you write in C? And I went, uh, I don't know. They mm-hmm. said, don't do that. Transpose your scores. And I went, uh, okay. <laughs> so that's how I learned to do that. You know, I, they're, they just told me to do it and I just did it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so great. Um, I don't want to gloss over the fact that you were the principal bassist of the Amsterdam um, Symphony. Is it Symphony or Philharmonic? Philharmonic. Philharmonic. Uh, but I like, that's a great story as well. Um, how you even, how you got that position. Yeah, I just, you know, it was it was an accident because um, I went to, went to Holland after Basie years to be with Tinica to be just hang out. And I knew there was a lot of music in Holland. I knew at the time that there were 16 government subsidized orchestras along with amateur orchestras and I'd studied classically and I loved the classic music and I'd practice it in my hotel room and all that stuff. Um, so I told a drummer friend that I was hoping to play solos with orchestras in Holland if, if it was possible. And he said, I know people in this world, I'll keep my ears open for you. So he called me one day and said, I just heard there's a solo position open in the Amsterdam Philharmonic. And I said, great. Well, s- solo position means principal. Mm-hmm. And I didn't mean principal. I meant stand in front and play solos. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I just took the information and got the audition materials. I thought, what the heck? Because I was already practicing a lot of classical music because I was in another competition, in the finals of another competition. So I just added it to what I was practicing and then played the audition and they invited me to play. So that's kind of how that happened. <laughs> it was, and of course I loved it. Totally yeah. loved it. I, you know, I still miss the music. Yeah. And then, you know, my friends in the orchestra too. Yeah. Um, and then you're leading a section. Are you, were you speaking English or? Speaking English. Yeah. And then I, as the time went on, I learned Dutch too, but, Everybody in the section, you know, it's Holland. Everybody yeah, in yeah. Holland speaks English. So, um, um, and I really didn't know what I was doing. You know, mm-hmm. you, you heard what what my what my backstory was before that. There was no principal bass work in it at all. Yeah, I played an American Youth Symphony when I was a te- teenager here in Los Angeles, but. Under Melai Meta, he was Zubin Meta's father. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I did, that, that was kind of it. And I played in the orchestra in, in, at Indiana University, and I I played a concerto with them as well. But I didn't know what I was doing, you know, to lead yeah. a section, a professional orchestra. Uh, so my stand partner, the assistant principal, basically taught me everything. Mm. He... He's still around. He's, you know, going. He's dealing with some health issues and stuff. But God, he's like a brother to me. Hmm. And he's the guy who, you know, he'd look at me and kind of out of the corner of his eye and, you know, kind of go whatever, raise an eyebrow, um, tell me, you know, it might help us if you did this. And I, you know. at at some point, I said to him, you know, why aren't you here? Yeah. <laughs> he said, I don't want the pressure. Because <laughs> so, uh-huh, uh-huh. he really didn't consider himself a leader mm-hmm. and he didn't want to have to, you know, deal with the nerves of playing the occasional orchestral bass solo and all that. Anyway, so he taught me how to do all that stuff. Jan Averts is mm. his name. Such an important guy in my life. Wow. So that's how that all unrolled. Um, did you feel the pressure back home in the States? Like, 
to be there to be on the scene at all while you were in Amsterdam? No, no pressure, but I missed it and I wanted to be um in the states. Not especially in Los Angeles because you know, don't forget I hadn't lived in LA in a long time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I was I left LA and that was 3 years at Indiana University, 2 years at Mount Alexander, 2 years at Count Basie. So that's already, you know, seven years of not being in L.A. Um, but the whole time I was in the States and I was playing and recording, touring, all that stuff. So that came to a halt. I even told Concord Records, you know, because I was I had done some records for them. Look, if you need me, I'll be there. I'll get myself to New York and if you can just fly me any place you need me to be yeah, from yeah. New York, if, if that's what you want to do and never happened one time. Mm -hmm. So it was, that was, that was a story. I'd come home every year on the, mm -hmm. on, you know, during vacations and stuff. But, um, so I did miss that connection. Yeah. Um, and, but you know, the music, it's always about the music, the music, fixes everything if you know look at the old saying you take care of the music it, it takes care of you mm -hmm. that was totally the case for me because um when i finally did after five years in holland move back to la it really was not about any reputation mm -hmm. or any connections i couldn't buy a connection <laughs> yeah but i went to I don't, I don't think I ever told you this story, but I wanted to get into studio work. Mm -hmm. So, of course, who did I go to? <laughs> Ray Brown. And uh, he said, well, you know, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll mention your name. And da, 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 da. I, mean, I knew Henry Mancini. I knew Quincy Jones. I knew a bunch of, you know, a bunch of people. But um, they didn't instantly have jobs for me. So the people that hire people, the hire the musicians for studio work are contractors. So I needed to, so I got a list of all, I got in the union book, mm -hmm. I got a list of all the contractors in Los Angeles. I went to Ray Brown's house. He told me, made a check mark of all the people that he knew and had worked for as contractors. So. I went home and I wrote that many letters ostensibly from Ray Brown hmm. introducing them to me, asking that they open doors for me. And I went to Ray Brown's house after typing these letters and it was a lot of letters. I ty was, I'm typing yeah, you know, yeah. that, that whole thing, not printing out. And then taking the stack of letters to Ray Brown, he signed each one mm. of them. Mm. I mailed them to all those contractors. I didn't get one call. Mm -hmm. This is recommendation from Ray Brown. Yeah, yeah. Who everybody respected. Yeah. Um, and nobody called me. So, you know, I. It's all about the music. Mm -hmm. It took just focusing on the music for there to be whatever buzz yep. was going to be created. And then little by little people mentioning my name to other friends. And that's how the doors started to open. And, and that hasn't changed. Yeah. Yeah. You're totally right. Yeah. 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 Um. I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I have, I have two uh, questions. Sure. Um, so, for instance, when you first met Ray Brown, you didn't know everything about Ray Brown, but later on in your life, you're getting to be on stage and make recordings with, you know, Benny Carter, Hank Jones, pe people of that stature. Did you start? Did you did you have that feeling while you're playing with them? Like, wow, I I, I can't believe this is happening. Have you Every had time. those? Yeah. Okay. Every time. Uh, you know, um, Ray Brown 
of course, initiated a, a lot of this, but then the ball gets rolling. And um, even if Ray Brown recommends me, you know, they're only going to call me back because of the music. Yeah. So that was, it's, it's always our job to just focus on making the music as, as happening, as joyful and, um, you know, you know me, I always talk about clarity mm -hmm. and honesty, you know, just make it as honest and with as much clarity as you can get. You know, if you're a bass player that is always dragging or always rushing or has intonation problems and stuff like that, then as much as people may love you, they're going to be a little reluctant to call because of the music. Mm -hmm. The music isn't at the level that they like. <clears throat> so that you know, whether it was, I, I've been so lucky and I know it, you know, I'm so blessed. I get it that, <clears throat> excuse me, that, um, I was lucky enough to be able to play with those people with, mm -hmm. with, uh, with the Hank Jones and Benny Carter. And the next thing you know, I'm in the studio with, um, you know, fast forward with, with a Diana Krall and a Paul mm -hmm. McCartney and a McCoy Tyner and blah, blah, blah. So that whole list of amazing musicians that I could rub elbows with, it's not lost on me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I, really, <laughs> I, I totally pinch myself. And, I, I, you know, one of my mantras is I am not worthy, but I belong here. Mm -hmm. So... I'm not worthy because they could call so many other people that have had perhaps more experience, more, it might be a better fit for the musician I'm playing with, but I belong here because I would do anything to be here. Yeah. You know, I would practice anything I need to practice and what I just, I, I want to be here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and was the Clayton Hamilton orchestra the beginning of that? Was that like a got to situation? It was like, okay, I have to, I have to do this. I have all this music happening. What yeah, really was, propelled you to do that? It was definitely a got to situation. I hadn't, hadn't haven't used that term, but yep, that's what it was. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, so when I was in Holland before moving to LA, uh, I was writing a lot. I'd already written a bunch for Count Basie. Then I moved to Holland and there were so many writing opportunities there for big bands and stuff. Cause for instance, there was a group, a big band called the Sky Masters and they would play every Monday night at Nick Folderbrecht's Jazz Cafe in Laden. Uh, and they would broadcast that live and they needed new charts every week because they'd have guests mm. they'd have slide hampton woody shaw freddie hubbard hank jones tommy flanagan uh all these people on and on and on every mm. mark murphy every every monday um so i got to write along with playing with the orchestra every every week i wanted to yeah. <laughs> um and i'd hear it on the radio that monday <laughs> So wow. it was, it was huge. So the whole time I'm writing, I'm also in touch with my best friend, Jeff Hamilton through the years. And he had joined, um, the LA four at that time. We're still in touch long distance. <clears throat> and I can't remember if it happened around that time or even before that, but he and I said something like, man, it would be cool to put our own band together, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the seed was planted at some point. And when I moved to LA, I, I did have some charts. I did have a small repertoire, but, um, um, one of the things that I wanted to do in, well, one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to be a film composer mm. and I wanted to be a studio player. Um, so I became a studio player. I studied film composing and uh, er, knock on wood early on, I discovered that, you know what? No, mm -hmm. this, that's, this is not, 
the direction I want to take my music mm -hmm. and life. So I always say jazz saved my life. And that's around the time that we started the Clayton Hamilton Jazz Orchestra. So it was Jeff Hamilton who, you know, had kind of schemed this with me and my brother who knew all the musicians in L.A. Mm -hmm. You know, he'd been there the whole time. He knew, well, if you're going to call this person who's a great player, don't call this guy because he married his former wife and they don't get all, you know, he knew all that yeah, stuff yeah. <laughs> <laughs> along with who the great players were, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, so that's how we started. You know, my brother put the people together. Uh, I wrote the music and conducted. Jeff Hamilton handled the finances, mm -hmm. which means that he didn't have a damn thing to do for a long time <laughs> we, the first gig the first gig that we did was at the hyatt on sunset there was a a, a promoter, promoter named ozzy kadina mm -hmm. and he started the jazz there and i walked in there one day and um just said have you ever had a big band in here he said no i said you know big band would sound great in here so I talked him into doing it, and we had a, if not a Monday night, an every other week kind of thing mm -hmm. for a while. And uh, the first gig, more people on the bandstand than in the audience. Of course. <laughs> so, and then we would, there was no give me your email address. It was go to to Kinko's or whatever it mm -hmm. was at that time, print up tent cards that had room for dresses and put them out on the tables and then collect them at the end of the night and send postcards to all these people. We did, that's how we built up wow. our, our, uh, <laughs> our audience. And eventually, uh, you know, the word got out and more and more people were into it and then the lines outside began to form so <laughs> but it's it was like that it was not an overnight success we and after the first rehearsal you know with guys like Bobby Bryant and Oscar Bashir and Snooky Young and Clay Jenkins and George Bohannon and Thurman Green Iron Nepus and you know Maurice Spears, uh, Bill Green, my brother, of course, Justo Almario was in our band, the first iteration, uh, all these people. Gerald Wiggins played piano. I think Andy Simpkins played bass wow. in the first rehearsal. Uh, and at some point, Al McKibben. Anyway, <laughs> uh, my job was to make sure that they'd want to come to the second rehearsal. Totally. Yep. You know, so I ended up writing music for those guys to make sure that they felt the focus and the love and the desire to to do this. And and it, and they did. To this day I write for the musicians. I don't write for the instrument. Mhm. Mm and was it um was it just a no-brainer to not play bass in the band? I mean, primarily, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. No brainer. Mm -hmm. There was no way I was going to be trying to do all that stuff, subtle stuff or whatever from back in the rhythm section. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it, if there are certain kinds of charts that you can write and do that. Mm -hmm. And I needed more freedom than that would allow me. Mm -hmm. mm. Unless uh, you have somebody up front to conduct it for you. Yeah. Well, I guess the whole band could have just faced you. Yeah. <laughs> After all, it is about. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. I also want to ask. Oh, yeah. Well, of course, I want to ask about. Um, I don't know how I want to put this, but I mean, just your love and your passion for teaching is so apparent in everything you do, even if you're not specifically teaching. 
Uh, I think it's that Ray Brown thing. We all we all kind of feel it. So, and I know you taught at U- USC for quite a long time. Was that just an easy thing to fall into f- for you, being able to help people? Yes. You know, again, you you mentioned Ray Brown. He is the one who told me, you know, because he helped me so much. One day he told me that he was helping me. I'm helping you, he told me, because somebody helped me, and you're going to help more people further down the line. Mm -hmm. And that's the rule. That's what we live by. Um, Everybody has to do it their way. Mm -hmm. Some people are fine in a university or school setting other people more privately other people you know just a workshop here and there but if you're honest with yourself then you realize that you got a lot of help to get to where you are Mm -hmm. and shame on you if you don't want to do that for others so but for me uh it, it happened honestly it happened when i was at indiana university as a student so there was a, a bass player who was the son of a professor that I was studying with. Um, I could have that wrong. I, I don't think I was studying with his dad. But anyway, he his dad taught it at, um, at, at Indiana University. And uh, he, this person got wind of me playing bass or he, I don't know, came to hear it. And, and, and he asked me, can I take bass lessons from you? Mm-hmm. And his name, he's a professional bass player now. His name is Doug Miller. Lives in San Francisco area. Uh, and Doug was my first student. Uh, from that point on, it was some Jamie Abersall camps that I did, other things like that. And um, kind of interrupted by my time with Monty Alexander and Count Basie. Mm-hmm. But then when I got to Holland, the, the teaching started up again. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something I have to do. We have to do, and we, we love doing it. Uh, I, I think we love, I think we all love doing it because, um, it's a way to not only to give back, but to validate your concepts and your mm-hmm. ideas and make you feel like you're on the right path and also to do a check yeah. because if you're not on the right path you know it's reflected in the student that you're working with or what you're saying or your ideas you know it's like well I'm hmm, maybe I should rethink that mm-hmm. so it's mm-hmm. it's just a wonderful thing all all around hmm. well yours I'll say from experience you're wonderful at it <laughs> Thank, you. Um, Thank you. I'm really proud of you for taking up the the mantle and doing it yourself and doing such a great, great, great job. Well, I, I absolutely love it too because it's that same thing. It's like you're looking in the mirror in in mm-hmm. a way, right? And then also nobody's the same. So you might you might think you have a bag of tricks that'll work for everybody, and you go, oh, well, this person's hands are much bigger than mine so yeah. this is dip let me go in and dissect oh let's try this you know yeah. and it's that's the fun part for me like everybody's different every you know there's no common base size right yeah, yeah. so you got to get get around that and i love it. it's not one size fits all and it's it's almost mm-hmm. like a fun like puzzle yeah, yeah. i agree yeah and, and something that- you you really eliminated for me was um aside from, you know, like technique and practicing and stuff was setting goals, Mm. like realistic goals and not to say unrealistic goals, but your dreams, just like you said, your dream was to play with Count Basie. Mm -hmm. And I remember having, making that list while I was, same with you, like Ray Brown, you had one lesson. I think with you, I've had three, three lessons, Mm -hmm. maybe including Vail, but I'm still, those are still, oh yeah, that's what John was talking about. Mm-hmm. But I remember having that goal list and just being able like, oh, I've checked this off, this off. Okay, what's next? Let's yeah. let's keep That's doing cool. it. Yes, it's, I don't think anyone leaves you feeling uninspired for sure. Um, it's interesting because the, the whole goal thing, uh, it, 
it works uh, for some and for many, I think. Um, I encourage everybody to try it and see if it's a good fit. And for mm -hmm. you, it was a really good fit. Mm -hmm. You know, but I think everybody should at least try it. And then, because I, I honestly, I didn't, I didn't have, I had ideas, I guess I had goals, I had dreams, I had kind of like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and it was only later that, that I understood stood that I could def, uh, define it as, as a goal, as a dream, mm -hmm. as a, you know, a focus. And because of that, I then thought, you know what? Um, let me pass this on to whoever I can with a little bit more focus than mm -hmm. I had. Because, you know, not everybody has the Ray Brown kind of mentor-mentee connection situation. But that doesn't mean that those people can't move forward in many of the same ways exactly. that you did and I did. So that's why I really encourage everybody to try the the goal concept uh, and then see how how you mold it for yourself or um or maybe not and, you know well i think too like you pointed out with you thought you wanted to do film scoring so when mm -hmm. you map out your goals and then you actually kind of start looking at it and this has happened with me like maybe playing with a certain person and then i go oh you know what that isn't actually what I want to do. And mm -hmm. this person, boy, they're the right person for this and they have the passion for that. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's exactly right. Okay, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about, I want to ask you about Super Bass and then I'll think I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let you go. Um, <laughs> Cause Super Bass started just with you and Ray and then there's all the arrangements you did with just you and Ray. And then Christian came into the fold. So I just, I just got to know how it started. <laughs> well, the Super Bass was the name of the album that Ray and I did, uh, where we overdubbed the bass parts. And then, you know, that was a happening. That was an event. Mm, nothing really happened with it. It just mm -hmm. sort of fizzled away. Uh, and then... We couldn't talk Concord Records into that, but Tom Burns of Capri Records liked the idea, and so bless him for letting us do it. Then, uh, years later, Ray Brown, because Ray and I would occasionally do duets yeah. here and there, uh, and then one day he said, hey, have you ever heard of this guy named Christian McBride? I said, yeah, of course. He said, I'm thinking about putting a group together with him, just you and me and him. I thought, oh man, that would be awesome. So <laughs> he did. And uh, we met in Pittsburgh at um, Manchester Craftsman's Guild. There was a concert with Ray's Trio and this introducing Super Bass, the three of us. We basically pulled together some arrangements at the sound check <laughs> and then that's how it all started mm. um we had fun then and ray brown just i think he just thought let's find more opportunities for this mm -hmm. and we, um, at some point ray said uh I, I think he said that he wanted us to record Mm -hmm. which then was the that was the carrot for us to get together and he so he told christian and me all right i want each of you guys to bring a couple of songs to the group and and that's how we put it together every and anytime we rehearsed or got together it was always bring something everybody had to bring something so uh and that's how it all happened there's still Still, some things I th I think I saw them in a, a drawer the other day that that we never recorded. Mm. Um, that we played played through. Maybe it needed some tweaking. I don't know what, but yeah. So there's still some 
on Discovered Super Bass. <laughs> well, I have an idea for that, but <laughs> <laughs> I knew you would. You're my <laughs> ideal woman. <laughs> um, well, gee, thank you, John. I appreciate it. And also, I, I don't know if you have an opinion on this, but why? I mean, I know so many bass players that love to cook, and you not only love to cook, but you're a bad mofo at it. So <laughs> you, you as well. Thank you. I will toot my own horn. I'm pretty good. You are good. <laughs> I can attest to that. Um, so what's what's next for you? I mean, that sounded, of course, whatever. What are you working on? I was going to say tortilla chips. Oh, yeah. I had some. I don't usually eat late at night, but, you know, after the gig last night, and I had a bunch of tortilla chips. <laughs> I just made some before, before I called you. Ooh. <laughs> and, um, you know, I just, you know, the drill. I just chop up the tortillas and a little oil, a little salt in the oven. And um, they they still had a little bit. They they weren't quite done. They still had needed a little bit more crunch. Mm -hmm. So I turned off the oven, and because I, I you know we had to get together, and I just I'll just turn off turn off the heat and leave them in. So now I'm wondering, uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> 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 so I'll, after this get together i'll let you know yeah let me know what happens <laughs> but it's all good so yeah what's next um um right now i've got some writing assignments to do you know so a couple of recordings small things arrangements for people um the larger things I, i've got to i've got to read you know after my brother jeff passed away this last year earlier this year uh last year i guess it was it's really been um I kind of pushed away mm -hmm. what's going to happen with that that um that musical vehicle in my life yeah you know, that group um so you know sort of like do i want to replace the clayton brothers with something else uh do i want to just you know let that be what it was mm -hmm. and not look at another ensemble and just continue to do you know pick and choose really cool things that i want to involve myself in so i'm going through that personal yeah. uh, thing had there's no no uh, result no decision made but i'm still kind of examining that mm -hmm. um in the meantime i yeah I'm, i am playing i've got a um this cool idea that bruce foreman thought of uh where whereby he has got his hands on uh barney kessel's guitar jeff hamilton has access to Shelly Mann's drums. Of course, I've got, you know, the bass that Ray Brown used to play. So we're going to have a meeting of the poll winners' instruments. Wow. And uh, so that's kind of, I'm really looking forward to that. We're not going to play the material. Mm -hmm. We're going to approach the situation as they did, mm -hmm. which was everybody kind of contribute some songs. Let's get together in the studio. We'll figure out the arrangements or any ideas that you have for arrangements, we'll figure them out in the studio. Um, and and this bass um, is the second bass that Ray. So uh, during the poll winners uh, years, which was in the fifties, maybe early sixties, um, that was not this bass. Mm. But the poll winners got together also in the seventies. To do a record yeah this is the base by then that ray had because ray brown purchased this space probably mid 60s mm -hmm. don't know the exact year 64 65 somewhere in there uh just before the we get requests record mm. uh, with oscar peterson so that's when he got this space so this this is actually a poll winner's bass yes uh but the one that did a lot of the early recordings that's another one so that's right so anyway i'm gonna do that project uh got another concert coming up with 
uh, I think it's a recording as well, with Roger Kellaway, mm. whom I first heard when he was playing with Ray Brown. <laughs> and um, I think John Guerin was on drums. But it was a, a concert that they played, a Ray Brown concert at L.A. Valley College when hmm. I was going to school there. So I get to, I, you know, it's kind of, I'm just mentioning because it's kind of a weird circle, right? Yeah. So it's a, it's, a, it's a circle period in my life, circling back to the pole winners records that Ray did with Barney Kessel and Shelly Mann, circling back to Roger Kellaway and mm-hmm. um, you know, some, some other stuff in between too. So yeah, it's, it's starting to happen, getting busier, writing more and more. Um, yeah, that's what's going on. Well, I would expect nothing less from you to be so busy. Well, thank you, John. I really appreciate you taking the time. It was really a pleasure for me to hear uh, some of these little unheard gems. And uh, I know you're such an inspiration to not just bass players, but, you know, everyone who who listens to your music and gets to see you perform. So thank you. Appreciate it. And, um, you know, I'll probably be seeing you soon. I hope so. It was a joy to hang out with you just now. And I'm so proud of you and everything you're doing. It's just awesome, really, really great. Oh, well. I'm going to continue to be your fan. Well, I have a great role model. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, cool. Um, I hope those tortilla chips are, are uh, just right. <laughs> Thank you. I'll let you know. <laughs> cool. All right. Thanks, John. Take care. All right, too. Bye.